Hello and welcome to the Magical Midlife Podcast, where you get a refreshing, uplifting and optimistic perspective on life in your 40s and 50s. I'm your host, Lindsay DeSwart, and I'm delighted that you've joined us here today. So let's jump right in. Hi, and welcome to the show today. On today's show, I am interviewing Jackie Hope, who is part of the Midlife Mountaineers. Her and her husband, Ray, discovered ice climbing at 47, and she shares with us their story of how they got there and what they do now, and also how you can benefit from their experience. Sit back, grab a cup of tea, and enjoy the show. Good morning, and welcome to the show today. I am delighted to welcome Jackie. So hi, Jackie. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I am very well, thank you. Now, I think I am speaking to you in a high octane adventure location that you're away at just now, aren't I? (laughs) Yes. So we are, um, so I'm Jackie Hope, and together with my husband, Ray, we are Midlife Mountaineer. And uh, we are on a mission to inspire midlifers to redefine what it means to be over the hill, as we sometimes say. Oh, my goodness. So cool. We are are prairie dwellers. But as I speak to you, we are in Canmore, Alberta, um, playing in the mountains. So we've been having a really good time here. Very nice. Now, you actually came to mountain climbing and ice climbing later in life, didn't you? We did. Uh, we started um, ice climbing was the first extreme mountain sport that we took on. And that was at 47. I was 47. Ray was 51. And that was kicked off by a trip that we took to Japan. So I lived in Japan from the years 1997 to 2002. Mm-hmm. And during that time, I lived in a mountain town and in the mornings I was able to just step outside my door and be on mountain bike trails. And, you know, I could cycle up to little mountain villages and art galleries. And it was just so beautiful to have the mountains part of my daily life. And I thought I would end up in the mountains, but as, um, you know, as fate would have it, I met Ray on the prairies and we got married in 2005. Mm -hmm. And, So we stayed there for family. And when Ray was turning 50, he used to practice Aikido. Um, He had a black belt in Aikido and he had always wanted to go to Japan, but he'd never been there. So I thought, well, maybe for his 50th, this is, you know, such a milestone, um, we should go. And at the same time, one of my girlfriends was getting married in Tokyo. And she said, you know, could, I was a singer. Um, I was a professional singer in another life. And she said, well, could you sing at my wedding? So we thought, well, of course we have to go do this. Yeah. And so we went to Japan on the trip. And while we were there, we, I took Ray back to where I used to live and we did some of the same, not mountain mountaineering. We, it was more hiking and mm-hmm. scrambling up rock. Um, but we did some of the same walks that I had done when I was there. And as soon as we were done, we thought, mountain sports and mountains need to be a part of our life going mm-hmm. forward. So we came back to Winnipeg and um, Winnipeg, Manitoba, and we joined the local chapter of the Alpine Club of Canada. We didn't know anybody. We didn't really know what they did, but we knew that they did mountain things. And funny, funny enough, the Alpine Club of Canada was actually born on the prairies in Manitoba. Manitoba was the first chapter. And so that's this, possible. Yeah. So this group <laughs> um, was set up originally so that people could train for mountain adventures. Mm-hmm. So we do um, lots of hikes, cross-country ski trips. I mean, there's not a lot of downhill, but surprisingly, there is a lot of ice climbing on the prairies because we farm the ice artificially. So I can tell tell you a bit more about that later. Um, Mm -hmm. But ice climbing was the first thing that we tried. And so that would have been, oh, I can't remember the year, but I'm 53. So it was, I was 47 at the time. Um, 
So we went down to the tower and actually I didn't want to try it at first. It just looked way too sketchy for me, but Ray really wanted to try. So I went and watched him. And by the second time he convinced me to try it. And did I love it? No, I got about, I got about 15 feet or 20 feet off the ground and that was as far as I could, I could do. It was just, it was so difficult. And, um, and I was very nervous on the rope, but at the same time, it was this feeling of, wow, like I just climbed a pillar of ice. <laughs> yeah. It's something I had never considered before. And it was pretty, um, it was pretty exciting. And so we kept at it. And through the years, we've added rock climbing um, we started mountaineering maybe the summer after that or the summer following. Um, we started doing some mountain objectives where we would fly into a base camp and we would have guides take us up all these uh, mountain peaks and learn to travel on glaciers and how to stop your falls if you happen to slip on an ice slope. And That's how do quite you useful. To stop. Oh, it's very useful. Quite, quite useful skill, I should it imagine. Is. I learned it. Yeah. Yeah, so that's wow. a bit of the history of how we got started. Fantastic. Now, you alluded to it earlier when you said you were a singer in a former life. Mm-hmm. So tell us a little bit about life before the ice climbing, because, I mean, that looks fantastic and people can find you on Instagram to see your pictures. And, mm-hmm. and I know you've that's grown into some really exciting things as well, which I want to touch on. But let's wind it back a little bit. Sure. Tell me about that former life as a singer because I don't know that all singers progress to ice climbing (laughs) (laughs) maybe it's an unusual path um kind of yeah that would be an interesting book maybe um (laughs) yeah I was um I started studying music when I was five years old I started piano and all through my life um I sang for different things but I was very shy very self-conscious and mm-hmm. I really, but I really wanted to be a singer. And so I, at the time I was teaching piano and I was teaching flute at uh, music school. And there was like a local, like a community festival where they would have local bands come out and sing. And I thought, you know what, this is my chance. So we put together a little band and, and I went and I sang and it was a complete disaster. Oh, <gasps> Yeah. The, I thought we had rehearsed enough, but the drummer, it sounded like he was playing a completely different song than oh no, doing. And yeah, it was a nightmare. And I went back to the music school and I bawled my eyes out. And yeah. I just felt like this is, a, I was a complete failure and I can't do this. But there was something in me that said, Jackie, if you don't get out and do this right away, mm-hmm. you'll never do it again. Mm-hmm. And so much a part of me that wanted to be a singer. So the following weekend, um, I went to um, an open mic night and I sang a song that I had written. And that was that was key in kind of cementing that, OK, that was a bad experience. But that doesn't mean that, you know, going forward, things can't get better. So it wasn't too long after that that I went to Japan and we were often, as uh, expats living in Japan, we were often asked mm-hmm. to be part of um, internationalization type festivals. And there was always music part of that. And some people were talking about, why don't we put, put a band together? And they said, well, we need a singer. Who's, who's a singer? And I thought, nobody in here knows that I'm not really a singer. So I said, well, I'm a singer. <laughs> cool. That's how I got started. So we had a, I had a band there. Um, we played a lot of festivals. Um, we were called Jackie and the Ramen, like the soup. Oh, yeah. Nice. It was all men that were in the band, except for me. And my hair was super curly. And so the kids used to call it Ramen because it was like curly. <laughs> so we thought, well, Jackie and the Ramen. So, yeah, we started out as Jackie and the Ramen. And then in 2000, um, I came home and to Canada and recorded my CD. So it's called Treasure. And uh, yeah, that was life changing. We went, I went back and toured it in, um, in Japan. I had another, a different band there. We toured it around and oh yeah, it was just so incredible. So music is very close to my heart, even though Mm. I don't don't practice or perform like I used to Um, that creative 
pull is always there. And so when we started Midlife Mountaineer, the writing and um, we also got into filmmaking and that has really fed that creative part of me. So it's been wonderful. Wow. That is just an incredible story. I I find it interesting, obviously, being a a coach and I really help people to look at their past and how it's playing out now and into their future. So I find it really interesting that you said about that particular event after the singing and how that felt like it was, you know, I I have to do this now or never. And therefore, you had to realise that it was that event. It didn't define you. Yeah. And how do you think or do you think at all that that has prepared you for taking on such an extreme sport that you're doing now? Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. We were um, we hired we're we're in Canmore, Alberta right now, and we hired um, an alpine guide to take us out into the mountains ice climbing on Monday. Mm -hmm. And I get very nervous walking on in alpine environments. They can feel very unstable for your feet. Um, you know, there's always the fear that you're going to, you know, go tumbling down the hill mm. and, or down the mountain. And what he said to me, so our guide was talking about um, better ways to move in the snow so that you're confident in your foot placements. And he said, mm-hmm. you know, you'll be fine. It's just about confidence. And with competence comes confidence. And the more we do something, the more competent we become, hopefully getting expert advice to help us, you know, get there a little bit quicker. Mm. And um, I think that move that I made back then to do it right away, so as to not create this narrative in my head that, no, you're not a singer, you can't do that, Mm. you're, you know, you're a loser, you can't, um, rather, looking at the circumstance that I was doing it in was more important Um, and realizing that, you know, it's the circumstances aren't always going to be like that. You're not going to have band members that don't rehearse before the performance. Um, You were prepared and that's what mattered. Mm -hmm. So as I did it more and more and more, I became confident in my Mm -hmm. book. And I don't know, you know, I'm 53 now, and I don't know that that feeling, that that discomfort ever really, at least for me, it never really leaves me. Like when I'm doing something brand new, mm-hmm. it's a period that it feels very uncomfortable. And, but I know just from experience that if I can push through that, you know, there's a really different experience on the other side of that discomfort. There's magic. That's a beautiful way of putting it. It really is. And so how, because people think, well, you know, oh, you're an ice climber, you must be really resilient. And singing on stage, (laughs) uh, traveling to Japan, all of these things, they take courage. They take real bravery. So, I mean, does that define you? If I were to say, you know, a very brave, courageous woman, does that define your whole story? Or is there more to it than that? Oh, boy. Um, Do you know, I don't know. I could see how from the outside it might look like bravery. But when I'm doing these things, um, when I'm getting into them, of course, now we've been ice climbing now for seven years and I'm very comfortable. I don't, you know, I don't get nervous when I do it. Um, But I don't know that it's so much, maybe, maybe it is bravery in that I'm feeling the fear and I'm doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, Which is an Instagram post in itself, isn't it? It is. I'm going to be all about the uh, the Instagram posts today. No, I I don't know what exactly it is sometimes that that pushes me through that, but I know that if I see something on the other side of fear that I really want and I feel like that's my path, mm-hmm. I have the ability to push through it and mm-hmm. just move through that uncomfortable period. Do I love it? No. Um, but it does take a certain amount of courage to step out into the unknown. And I've always known myself to be adaptable and I can figure things out. Um, I think Mm -hmm. it's one of my superpowers through my life that I can go somewhere and recreate my life. I can make Mm -hmm. friends. I can find work. 
I can figure out how to navigate in a new community, even where I don't speak the language. Um, mm -hmm. So I know that I have the tools to help me get through that discomfort zone into the magic zone where things come together. But it's because I have a lifetime of experience um, being in midlife. I think it's one of the real benefits um, that we bring to the table, because even if we are starting something completely new, like for us, it's blogging and social media marketing mm -hmm. and those things. We still bring so much experience to the table um, from our lives before that, that we're never really truly a beginner at anything. We always bring experience that helps us move through that discomfort zone to get to the other side. But does it take courage? Yeah, I think it does take courage to um, courage and trust in yourself that you can get through that. Yeah, I love. Yeah, I love that that we never actually come to something as a complete beginner. I love that. That's a great perspective, and you know, you you put it so beautifully. So, if people are thinking about you know a dream that they've got, yeah, or a goal that they want to go after, of course, society is quite happy to say, oh, you know, middle-aged women, you're a Karen, you're a this, you're a that. And therefore, we can be quite easily distracted. And a few of my, or discouraged, should I say, a few of my podcast guests who have done incredible things have come up against this literally in a conversation for somebody to say, oh, you're too old for that. Or, mm -hmm. oh, no, no woman's ever done that before. You couldn't do that. And yet they've gone ahead and done it. Mm -hmm. And they've tackled some hurdles in order to get there, but they've done it. Mm -hmm. So what have been the hurdles that you've faced along the way? Well, when we first started, um, when we first started doing extreme sports, um, so yeah, there were some challenges when we first started ice climbing and climbing in general, I, I used to get vertigo at height huh. and I don't know if it was too vertigo, but you know, we would be walking down a narrow trail. I, I remember for the first, the first time it happened, we were up near Banff. Mm -hmm. and we were doing this hike and we were walking along a trail and there were sheer drops on both sides and the trail probably was quite wide but all I could see as I was walking down the trail is I was looking at the little stones in front of me and everything mm -hmm. around on either side was swirling and I thought oh what yeah. is going on here so I made it across but it just hit me and so that was always in my mind um I had a real difficulty being at height when we were on, mm. of course, you have to be at height when you're on a, um, a nice tower or on a rock on a cliff and you have to learn how to fall. So you're right. in a harness and you, the rope stretches. So you're, as long as the anchors and your belay are, are, are safe, they're, you're, it's a very safe sport to do, but you have to know what you're doing. But mm. so there was um, like the fear of falling was always there and it took me a while to get used to that falling and I had to do it again and again and again um, I was very nervous on the side of cliffs so I always had to clip myself in for safety even though I was well within the safety zone um, it took me several years to get past that and I have um, you know throughout my life I've had issues with anxiety Anyway, it wasn't surprising that this came out when we started to do these, you know, sports that many consider to be quite extreme, even though while we're doing them, we don't feel extreme. We're just out there doing. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Some might consider it extreme. <laughs> so these, I mean, I certainly don't blame these sports on uh, my anxiety on these sports because um, they've actually brought a lot of community and, um, and healing to some experiences in my life. So most recently, um, and I share this story because I know from going through this, that there are many out there that are experiencing similar issues. Mm -hmm. um, my life really changed last August. Um, we, my husband and I were actually in Canmore. We were on a vacation here and we were driving back and I started to have a panic attack and, and it was about going back to work. Ah. And like many in healthcare and education, 
uh, mm -hmm. I had worked myself to the bone. Um, there was a whole confluence of factors that made, um, you know, workloads were heavy. And, and this is a, this is across many, many, um, professions. I know I was, I was mm. alone in this. Um, but on the way home, I just started, I panicked and saw my family doctor when I got back and that was it. He, um, I was diagnosed with, you know, the big three anxiety, depression, and panic disorder on top of it right i think the pressures of work the constant stress and worry of COVID, constant uncertainty um, brought some childhood trauma to the surface i was in a very mm. serious accident car accident when i was 16 and there were signs probably for about nine months that things were not going in a positive direction you know i I was starting to lose my ability to concentrate. Um, I would lose track of the conversation in meetings. Um, I actually had a breakdown in a meeting. Um, couldn't stop crying and had to step away. So my executive function at work was probably about 30 to 40% of where it needed to be. And I was in a management role. And so this was this was scary for me. Mm, absolutely. But it, it was like I was in a constant state of being on edge. Right. So um, I was off for several months and my job became getting my health back. Every day I did gentle exercise. I was I often walked with friends. They were really my lifeline. I stretched. I went to specific counseling for trauma. Um, mm -hmm. I did. I, I had a physio. I sometimes went twice a week. What I didn't know is that chronic stress often creates chronic muscle issues in your shoulders and your neck. And yeah. And I went for a massage. I completely changed what I was eating and drinking. And and I still would sleep nine hours and need to sleep two to three hours in the afternoon. So I was mm -hmm. completely burnt out. And, um, and it took me a few months really before I started to come out of that. I can't actually remember a lot about those first few months. Um, okay. Very, um, yeah, it was like nothing I'd ever experienced. Um, so in late November, um, I started to think about like, what do I really want my life to look like? now and, and that's a brave question in itself and it's yeah and it can be a very scary question and it can and I thought you know I had been working in education for over 20 years and for the first time I found myself in a position where I had completely lost any spark for mm. my um, field and it took a long time for that spark to come back yeah. Um, I did. I made the decision to leave my management job in December and, and wanted to take some time to really think about what this next step was going to be. And in this, I recognized there's a tremendous privilege in being able to do this. Um, I had good benefits at work. Um, I have, you know, we are a two income household. I don't, I don't know how people have managed to get through the pandemic and work stress without having a community around them. I, I don't know how they do it. Yeah. Um, so I recognize in, you know, being able to take this time was a tremendous privilege for me. Mm -hmm. But during that time, our dreams from Midlife Mountaineer also started to, to take shape. So one of the things that we took up during the, the pandemic was um, kind of a funny pandemic hobby, but we started to take up filmmaking. We had all oh. this time on our hands. Yeah, We were saving all this money, not going out to restaurants. So my husband has already, always been interested in filmmaking. And he, um, we invested in a bunch of film equipment and huh. decided that we wanted to make a film about um, ice climbing on the prairies. This community um, that we didn't know anything about we started before we joined them they have become our best friends they've become our support through the pandemic and the wonderful thing about for us as older climbers was that many of the folks in this group were in their 50s they were in their 60s some were in their 70s my first um belayer um at the tower um the tower in winnipeg that we climbed was in his late 60s 
And he's oh really how to get up a rock face. It, it just it, it just opened up my eyes to a whole new way of aging. And that mm-hmm. aging doesn't need to be like my grandparents. It doesn't need to be, you know, all sitting in the recliners and Ovaltine and Afghans. Like it can be active. <laughs> it can be active and fun and nothing against Afghans. I, I think Afghans are lovely. <laughs> <laughs> but we wanted to have um, an active midlife. We want to create a life for ourselves now that will help us ensure that when we're in our 70s and we're in our 80s, that we have we're active and healthy. Yeah. And so this um, community has really become a, a big part of our lives. Mm-hmm. And um, and midlife mountaineer, we wanted to tell the story of these ice climbers or these climbers, and we want to tell the story. Our goal, we're at the early stages, um, so we have a blog, we have um, our films, we've done some short films to learn the techniques to do bigger films, right? And we want to um, share the stories of midlifers who are def- redefining what it means to be over the hill. So that's our mm-hmm. goal eventually is to be able to share all of these stories through film and um, through our blog and um, and hopefully create something for us in our retirement. You know, five, six years down the, the road that Midlife Mountaineer is our thing. Yeah. So that's, yeah, fantastic. So um, your husband, Ray, Mm -hmm. what was his background? I mean, was he always kind of an athlete or anything? Was he always active or a sports person? Well, he wasn't, but I swear in another life, he was an Olympian. He's one of these guys that, (laughs) he's one of these people that with little to no training can just do pretty much anything without a lot of repercussions. (laughs) Whereas... I have the repercussions, you know, after going out ice climbing on Monday, my knees have been swollen, you know, for a couple of days, but he's Mm -hmm. very naturally athletic and he's the kind of person who he is uh, dyslexic actually. So he grew up with dyslexia and he uh, was able to access um, like an intervention for it very early on. So he was able to develop tools to live with this. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really his story to tell, but um, the long and the short of it, it's made him very analytical. And so when he gets into any kind of new activity or sport or hobby, he learns everything about it. So right. he became proficient in um, anchoring systems and various climbing techniques and mm-hmm. mountaineering. And he's gone on to do certifications and courses. He's become very, prof- he can become very proficient at something quite quickly. Right. He's in IT. He's worked in IT um, for many, many years. And um, that's his uh, full time position now is uh, he leads IT for um, for a company in uh, Canada. And Mm -hmm. he always had an interest in filmmaking. Um, For many years now, our family has done on Christmas Day, we do a a year in review and our family members submit. they submit pictures and videos and we put them in into a movie that Mm -hmm. watch on Christmas day and everybody really looks forward to it. And um, we started with PowerPoint presentations and now Ray has developed them all into like these feature films that we watch on Christmas day. It's, it's pretty amazing. So he's wow. Interest in filmmaking. And so when the pandemic rolled around, um, rolled around, that sounds a bit, uh, Oh, that's a lovely way of describing it, though, because we can just downplay what an incredible kind of, I don't know, wrecking ball effect it's had on so many things. Yeah. And for us, we couldn't do anything. And so we invested in film equipment and we were able to be outside with our with Mm -hmm. planning friends. So we thought, well, let's do a film. And so we started filming just on our iPhones in the first year. And then um, in 2020, we invested in some equipment. And during lockdown, he taught himself filmmaking. (laughs) That's so cool. So now we're working on a film. It's, uh, we now have a name, it's called Prairie Ice Farmers. Um, The story of ice climbing on the prairies. And 
we have, um, so there are a couple of key figures in our community that have really made this happen. So we have um, a 60 foot ice tower in the middle of Winnipeg that Mm -hmm. um, it's a club and we can all go and, you know, just get out of our cars and go climb. Whereas when you're in the mountains, you usually have a, like a longer approach to get to a climbing destination. But in Winnipeg, we can just, we're out out of our cars climbing and (laughs) some friends of ours. So this has been around for about, well, over 20 years. And then we have another friend who spearheaded artificially icing cliffs in Northwestern Ontario. So Hmm. they have a pump system that brings water up from the frozen lake and um, feeds it up to the cliffs and they create waterfalls and we climb on waterfall ice basically on the prairies. So these are oh my goodness. Yeah, so we we wanted to tell the story about this community that has welcomed us in. And it's quite a unique story in the middle of the prairies because people don't usually yeah. think about ice climbing on the prairies. They think about the mountains. So yeah, that's our project. So that's our, that's our big project for this year. We're working on it. So we have um, a trailer right now. We have a spot on our website for our film, our filming projects. And uh, we have one trailer out right now, and we're going to be releasing one and the second trailer very shortly. But our plan is to release that film um, sometime later this year. Well, how exciting. Yeah, we're pretty excited about it. Never well, you jump- thought we would be doing this at our <laughs> now. At the- yeah, at our age. Well, isn't that fun, though? Yeah, it's been. I can only say it's been magical. Like. Mm. the the people that we've met the opportunities that we've had I'm a believer that when you're on the right path the universe Mm. rises to meet you and I've just experienced it so many times in my life um, that when I'm on a creative path especially I'm a creative person and when I'm on those paths things come in front of us that um, it feels when it happens it just it feels like magic. I, I don't know how else to describe it. Yeah. Filmmaking has been like that for us. See, that's incredible. Cause as you say, when it's almost the less, you know, about how it's all meant to work out mm-hmm. the better. Yeah. Yeah. Cause then you can't try and, you know, micromanage it and plan mm-hmm. it. Cause there's um, my teacher. One of the things that she would always say is a planning mind is an unhealed mind. Oh, interesting. Which is interesting when you're about to go into the new year and you're about to start goal setting. Right. And she then reminds you, actually, that, oh, what the heck's that? You know, you've spent all of this time working on yourself and yet you still want to make a plan. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. So a he- is that- a planning mind is an unhealed mind. Yep. Oh, I like that. I mean- because you're still under the illusion that you can control the outcome. Yeah, yeah. And it, isn't it so hard sometimes <laughs> to let go of the outcome, even in the mountains, you know, we th- we do everything we can to be safe in the mountains. Um, we are not experts at mountain terrain, so we don't go out there without um, people who know it. But even the people who know it well, they say the mountains aren't good or bad. They're not fair or unfair. They're just dangerous mm-hmm. and things happen. And when, yeah, it's very difficult when you, sometimes when you, you, you do everything you can to plan, but you still have no control over the outcome. So just yeah. letting go of that and enjoying the moment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you posted a video the other day of you guys, uh, I don't know if you were tobogganing or just sliding <laughs> down some <laughs> tiny little route and it looked hysterical and that surely is the epitome of actually just letting go and not trying to control oh, well it might have looked that way but I was trying to control my speed so that was a really funny day um yeah it is up on my it's up on my reels I think but we were um a group of us so we had a group of friends from Winnipeg out here for about a week and we did mm-hmm. we called it multi-sport week and so we did something right. different every day but that day we were there's an area at the back of Lake Louise called Mm -hmm. Louise Falls and it freezes every winter so people go and they ice climb now it is a dangerous spot it can be avalanche there can be some avalanche activity there so we we were pretty careful being there but anyway so 
we skied to the back of the lake and then we climbed up to the cliff um, where the ice was. And then somebody had created this slide down. It's a pretty, it's a pretty, it was a pretty hard slog getting up and down there. And it can feel Mm -hmm. sketchy when you're walking down a snow slope. Um, So somebody created this slide. And so I'm standing up there. Um, Ray knows that I'm very nervous about speed. I don't like speed, like when I'm skiing or anything like that. I just feel I need to be in control. So I'm a bit of a control freak. Um, so he said, oh, Jack, you don't worry about it. You'll be fine. And everybody is, yeah, do it, do it, do it. And so I thought, okay, they say, say it's going to be fun. <laughs> yeah. So I sat down and it was slower at first, but then I started picking up speed and I, and I was using my hands to try and control. But what it did is that it made me off balance. So I started like flopping around like a rag doll coming down. You saw the video and, <laughs> and I start flopping around and, and I realized that, wow, like by trying to control myself, I actually made it worse. Wow. I love that. Yeah. And so I thought if I just like let myself go and trust that at the bottom, you know, I'm there's somebody there, they're not going to let me go. F- and even if I did go further, there's nowhere to go other than just down another gentle hill, but mm-hmm. I worked myself up into this frenzy and then I tried to control myself even more than I needed to and it just it took me off course so it is a pretty funny video and I did not get hurt even though I'm flopping around (laughs) my friends couldn't stop laughing at it was pretty funny I was laughing too (laughs) gotta be honest with you I'm happy to bring joy to people's lives (laughs) yeah it was very very fun I I mean it just looked fantastic but (laughs) Yeah, I mean, thank you for sharing that story. That's so cool. So where actually can people find you? They can find us, of course, on Instagram. We're midlife underscore mountaineer. And we have a website. It's midlifemountaineer.com. And we would love to have you uh, have your listeners join our community. We have have a newsletter we're going to be releasing shortly. And um, can find us on Facebook. We're Midlife Mountaineer on there. And we have a YouTube channel. So there's links to all of our social media on our website as well. Now, if somebody decides that they are so inspired by what you've talked about today mm-hmm. and they want to go and start ice climbing, ah. what sort of resources could they go and look at? Should, well, they, should they start at a climbing wall if they're not necessarily living in the great frozen north of Canada? <laughs> well, you know, that's actually how I started. I went to, I wasn't sure... One of the big fears I had in starting ice climbing was just being in a harness and roped and off the ground. And there mm-hmm. is some, um, you do need to learn to trust that whole system. Um, mm-hmm. You're, you know, the person that's belaying. Um, so in, in climbing, you have a harness, you're tied into the rope in a particular way. And on the other end of the rope, you have a belayer that's controlling um, your descent. And so um, all of those systems are really important and it's important to learn how to trust them. So we went to an indoor wall. I learned how to belay Ray. Um, Mm -hmm. I learned how to fall off the wall, which the first time was a bit scary, but Mm -hmm. is then yes, the rope stretches and it holds you. And so that's a really good step is to go to a climbing gym where you have experts that can take you through all of the steps that you need to be safe. These are not, I mean, we are doing extreme sports that if done incorrectly and the safety systems are not done well, it it can Mm -hmm. literally life and death. So anybody who's considering getting into these sports, you need to get good expert advice in how to do these systems. Um, But when done safely, it's, they're wonderful, but I would, yeah, I think it's a great step is to go to a climbing gym. Because they're, they're okay. it's very controlled. You can ask for advice. And if you're, for people who are older, who are in midlife, I think it's really important to, to, you know, you need to go back to what it was like to be a beginner at something. Many of the people that are, that are teaching you or coaching you, they could be half your age. My first teacher was 25. He was really? wonderful. He taught me how to belay. He taught me how to move on the wall. He taught me how to fall, all of these things. So um, when you are getting into sports at an older age, many of the folks are going to be younger than you. 
So learning yeah. to be a good beginner, um, looking for ways that you can give back. Like we're not competing. We're not, we're not trying mm. to compete in these sports. You know, if I was 20 years old and I thought, Oh, maybe I might be a competitive ice climber someday, but now I'm not going to be doing that, but I can improve. And one of the things that Ray and I have done is we've looked at different ways that we can give back to the sport. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be competing, but we do have leadership experience. So Ray is very involved in um, the different climbing associations. So he's involved in one right now that will be the first um, association for competitive climbing in Manitoba. We've never had a, a, a provincial sports organization for this. So he's mentoring because he has leadership experience. He's mentoring the group of folks that are doing, that are building that club. Um, he's, you know, he, he sits on boards. We lead trips. We uh, mm -hmm. lead ice climbing trips. So there's so many different ways that people can get involved in these communities that aren't necessarily the sport, even though they're around the sport. So yeah, yeah I, I would say um, get expert advice. Mm -hmm get out there and practice with the community. Um, climbers are really cool people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't just say that because we're doing it. <laughs> They're very, um, like, it's just so welcoming and kind and encouraging and just wonderful people and yeah. involved in those communities. They've, they've become our best friends and they are our circle now. Um, yeah, just so many different types of people are attracted to the sport and um, it's wonderful to get involved. But yeah, climbing walls are a great, a great place to start. Okay. And an alpine Excellent. club, if you have an alpine club in your area, um, it's a great, okay. great place to join. Okay, very cool. Well, Jackie, I'm conscious of time, as I always am with the podcast. I want to say a huge thank you. I know it's taken us um, a little bit of toing and froing in order to make this happen. So I'm so <laughs> delighted that we finally connected. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay, for inviting me to be part of the Magical Midlife podcast. It's really been an honor for me to be part of part of the conversation. And, you know, we're really relatively new to this blogging and filming journey. And if the Instagram community has been so inspiring for us to meet folks mm -hmm. like you um, who are having these great conversations about this exciting time of life. And um, yeah, I'm just so honored to be part of it. Thank you so much, Jackie. Thank and to Ray too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I will tell him. <laughs> what did you think of the show today? If you've enjoyed it, please leave a review on whatever podcast platform that you're listening on. Also, you can come and join us at the Facebook group for The Magical Midlife. And on Instagram, if you're on Instagram, I'm under Lindsay DeSwart, where you will find the podcast being released there every Wednesday. I really look forward to seeing you there and hearing your comments and any questions. And please come over to the Instagram account or to the Facebook group where you will find downloads and free gifts to help you lead your most magical midlife. See you there.